Dr. B. Venkatraman, President Global Sales Marketing, Advanced Material Business, Aditya Birla Group, to come on stage and join me here. And we shall together, we'll be introducing our panelist for the panel discussions. And the topic will be challenges and opportunities for industries in achieving green and sustainable goals. I hope all the panelists are here. So Dr. Prashant Samant, hope he's here. So I guess Dr. Deepak Yadav is here. So please come on the stage. So I guess people are not clapping, so they are not willing to come on stage. Yeah, that's not done. Mr. Ashok Dube. Mr. Nitesh Mehta. Dr. Subramanya Shripati. And Dr. Prashant Samant, is he here? So he's the VVIP, I guess, <laughs> the most awaited one. So uh, meanwhile, since the gentlemen are here, we'll uh, like to proceed uh, with the uh, bouquet. And I would request uh, our president from Irma to please hand over the bouquet to our panelist. Let me take the Our president is very, very active one, I must say. He's the one who's running the whole show and himself running around. A huge round of applause for our president as well. A huge and bigger one. So I guess Dr. Prashant Samant is with us. <laughs> And I was pretty very sure that he is indeed a VVIP here. The most awaited one. So make yourself comfortable. It's your home and family. So uh, on that note, uh, Dr. Venkatraman, the stage is all yours. Yeah, that, that I saw and you people are looking more 10 years younger. And evergreen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but look, look, looking from the lady's eyes, you know, from, the, from this side of vision. Maybe the purpose is something else that technically you people will be handling. Flattered, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Pallavi, and uh, very good evening to everyone. So it's a very interesting uh, topic, right? So challenges and opportunity uh, in achieving these sustainable goals for the Indian industry. That's an opportunity we are here to talk about and uh, I think Prashant you said you know to explain why we are wearing the green t-shirt the thing is when you are talking about sustainability a kind of message we want to give it to everyone saying that we really care for our environment society where we live and uh, yeah that's right this forest green is uh, t-shirt is an idea that came in I think it looks nice actually for all of us right thank you So, just before we start this session, you know, what I thought is I love a, you know, small introduction of all the panel members, number one. Uh, number two, I'll also try to give a context about this panel discussion, what we are going to discuss about it, right? And then we'll just go through this panel again. The objective of the panel discussion is to see, as an industry where we are, what we can do small things that makes a big difference in sustainability at the end of this panel if we can get out four or five ideas each of us carry back that's what the expectation out of the panel right and we expect to have around maybe 45 minutes and then the open questions that's how we want to do this a quick introduction on the panel members i think you know uh, one thing when we when we talk about the panel we wanted to have people from a diverse industry experience uh, here we are people from CEW Centre for Energy and you know, so I think I'll ask you guys to introduce yourself rather than me introducing. So why don't Nitish you can just go ahead, come. Hi, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, so my name is Nitesh Mehta, I am one of the co-founders and directors, so I represent two companies here. One is Nureka Green Synth Technologies. So we are a company offering uh, technologies around green chemistry to the chemical industry including pharma, dyes, chemicals, and uh, all specialty chemicals included. Uh, and then I also run a non-profit organization called Green Chemistry Foundation, 
where we interact with all stakeholders of chemical industry, including uh, regulatory bodies, government bodies, industry, solution providers, everyone, to bring them together to organize this kind of conferences around green chemistry and sustainability, uh, including offering some corporate training workshops to those companies who are keen on uh, uh, green chemistry training for their chemists. So that's my short answer. So Nitesh is very passionate about the green chemistry. We'll come to know. Thank you, Nitesh. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, <coughs> I am Subramanya Shripati. I work for Asian Paints uh, r and So I am with Asian Paints for 15 years now. Um, started my career working on corrosion science, then moved to surface science. And then now I am looking at raw material development and material characterization. So as an add-on, I, I am also responsible for the product stewardship uh, part of ESG framework for Asian Paints. Thank you. Thank you, Shripati. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is actually coffee with Venkat, not coffee with Karan. Oh, that's nice, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Dr. Samant, uh, past president Irma, and I think enough introduction has been already done in the morning, so I will not introduce again. But more than 30, 35 years of experience, and uh, I know a little bit of... But I'm interested in chemistry, actually. Chemistry between human beings is of utmost interest to me. And if it is green, then further. Okay. <laughs> Looking forward to interaction, Venkat. Thank you. That's our evergreen Dr. Samant, right? Thank you. Evergreen. Yeah, that's ever, ever forest green. Great. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ashok Dube. I am uh, with Reliance for the last 10 years, uh, heading their new materials business, wherein we are coming up with new polymers, reinforcement materials and other things, including carbon fiber. Started my career, uh, the Aditya Virla group of companies can say sort of Prashant and Venkat were my colleague, not at the same time, but yes, spent 15 years with Aditya Birla group of companies. Now, uh, then did uh, in between a couple of uh, greenfield uh, projects in Middle East and India, now for the last 10 uh, years with Reliance, uh, with the acquisition of one company in Baroda, we acquired that company called Camrock. And now uh, we have revived that and uh, we are uh, into downstream composite products as also coming up with a lot of uh, new materials, including carbon fiber, Kevlar and other things. So that's what uh, we are into. Reliance uh, as a company wants to make a mark in new materials and downstream applications. That's what I'm heading as of now. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Deepak Yadav, a program lead at CEW. So CEW is the Council on Energy, Environment and Water. We are a not-for-profit policy research institution based out of New Delhi. Uh, I have been at CEW for about four years now, primarily working on green hydrogen, carbon capture and utilization, and storage, decarbonization of the industrial sector, mostly on steel, cement, uh, fertilizer. And I am the only non-resin guy uh, on the panel discussion here. So, Oh, you are also a non-panel, non-resident non guy. Okay, so you know that, that's it about me. I look forward to you know having a good interaction and discussion with everyone here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Deepak. I think that's been intentionally designed in such a way that so we have someone from uh, industry and somebody from the regulatory body who's advising the government, so that we exactly look at sustainability in a 360-degree angle. Right? Thank you very much. So uh, quickly about me, uh, I'm Dr. Venkat. I am the president and. Uh, 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 global aid for sales and marketing of uh, Aitya Billa Advanced Material Business with the group for the last nine years. Okay, so before we start this context, you know, I, I, I just wanted to put up a video. So let's go through a video, maybe a two minute video before we start this discussion. Video, please. This is a goal. It's our whole and soul. It's a goal. It's a goal. It's a goal. शादी का ढोल है नए से दिखने वाले जूते का टूटा हुआ सोल है कचरा लाइफ की हाईवे पे गाड़ी दौड़ाने का ढोल है पर कचरे का भी मोल है उसके अंदर भी सोल है उसे दफना मत जला मत डुबा मत तैरा मत इसका सही इस्तेमाल फ्यूचर के लिए अनमोल है लाइफ के पर्दे पर वेस्ट का डबल रोल है क्योंकि दुनिया गोल है हमारी होल एंड सोल है
अगर इरादा हो सच्चा वेस्ट को बना सकते हैं अच्छा Thank you guys I think you know I don't think anyone can explain the importance of sustainability waste management it's a very nice video it's part of our uh, Aditya Billa groups initiative uh, in, in promoting sustainability in every part of our business so that's trying to set the context here so let's get into the panel discussion with next slide please great so what we are talking here is is a you know, green initiatives for the industry, right? Uh, if you look at this environment part, social part, governance part, there are regulations that are, you know, uh, defining or governing this sustainability initiatives. And plus, a lot of industry initiatives. You know, we have gone through the initiatives by Asian Paints, Kansai, AXO, Berger, you know, how they are working and what all they have done in the initiative to improve sustainability in the operations. Now let's talk about environment, right? When you look at environment, I just, you know, they're all talking about Paris Agreement and everything. A simple thing, one degree increase in the global temperature, global warming, that is going to have adverse impact on the climate, on everybody's life, right? I was trying to capture this, you know, how can I explain this to a common man? We can't talk about Paris, right? So that's where this, this one, uh, Shairi, you know, I'm not that good in Hindi, but I'll try to say that. Which says, Garmi ka alam ye hai ki, Garmi ka alam ye hai ki, Mitti ka matka bhi, Mitti ka matka bhi, Apne, Mitti ka matka bhi, Apna aadha pani khud pi jata hai. Mitti ka matka bhi, Apna aadha pani khud pi jata hai. So I don't think, you know, I'm just reading that, I don't know, it's, it's so nicely done. It, nobody can explain better than this, the importance of global warming. I think that's where, it, maybe if you want to repeat again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you're done and everyone has understood. Okay, so that's, that's the point. So, so, gentlemen, here it's most important part is, how important is the global warming? Today you look at India, like the India's global manufacturing, in, by 2030, 30% of our growth is going to come from manufacturing. 30% of our GDP. You just think, if that much manufacturing is going to happen in India, what is going to happen on the emissions? What is going to happen on the resources like water? Where is the power, right? Just think, it, 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 it's going to be enormous kind of growth, but how are we going to manage this growth? Now, we all know China has grown. China has become world's largest chemical factory today, right? 50% of the global chemical production happens in China. 50% demand also happens in China. They're the cheapest centralized factory supplying all over the world. What happened to China today? The China people, the China government realized it's not only about the growth, it's also about the environment. It's also about the people. I can't grow at the cost of my own people, right? Why is, so the low cost, the developed countries moving their production and manufacturing into a low cost manufacturing. I think in, in the part of an agreement, they are supposed to pay, pay 100 billion dollar for helping this developing country to set up the sustainability goals. Otherwise, you will not be able to protect your environment and society. So that is an importance today when you look at import, you know, environment from an Indian context. I remember in 1994-90s, all of us have traveled to Uncle Eshwar and the entire part of the belt, right? Gujarat. We couldn't even breathe, right? The, the amount of chemical 
uh, exposure because chemicals are hazardous, dangerous, you know, the volatiles. It's been very difficult to manage. So are we going to leave this kind of environment to our people? Do we want to leave? Just ask the questions. Look at agrochemicals. India become a, becoming a global manufacturing for agrochemical. What is happening? Your herbicide, fungicide, insecticide. They're all what? Chemicals. Unless otherwise you use safe chemicals. Unless otherwise you are conscious about what you are adding in your formulation, you will not be able to give a safe environment to the society. So we need to be very cautious and careful. That's all about the, the, the environment. So, so society, if you look at it, we don't want another Bhopal incident, right? Everybody knows one of the worst disasters in the chemical history is Bhopal. And, and there was an ammonium nitrate blast, you all remember that happened in Beirut? Again, chemical. So it's, it's nothing wrong about the chemical, it's how you handle the chemical, right? We know the tiger and lion kills us. That's why they've been kept in a cage. So the way you handle chemical, you need to understand the process and the green part of it and manage it. That's very important. So, so society is very important. We can't have a growth at the cost of our society. And of course the governance comes. A lot of regulations, if you look at it, reach regulations. Anything I export to Europe, you need to have a regulation, right? All product has to be registered, reach registered. And then you have TASCA, that's called Toxical Substances Act in US. So every country has put a kind of regulations where you can't dump product into the country. So the developing countries have to be careful. India is a country today, if you look at the entire petro, you know, petroleum chain, right? C1, C2, C3, C4, we all understand that. Today, C1, C2, C3, all getting imported into the country. So the feedstock dependence of us with this entire, you know, China is very high. Whether it is ethylene chain or a propylene chain, so we are, we are dependent on other countries. So we need to be very careful what we are importing, how we are managing this chemistry. That's part is coming in the regulation side. And industry initiative, everybody is working on simple, am I using the water? It's a, it's a, it's a resource that we need to take care. Am I moving into a coal base to a, a, what do you call the renewable resource, windmill, solar? Are we using those power? I think that's very important. And in every, every daily life, whatever we do, how can I contribute to this environment? What should we do? I think that's where the awareness should happen. So this is a context. So the whole discussion we are going to have about this, understanding this and taking forward. So I hope the context is clear, right? Now let me just get into this uh, you know, discussion with our esteemed panelists here. So the first question, you know, it's very important. I'll just uh, put this question. Uh, I think good, good to all of us, right? I don't know. Uh, there is uh, something called free culture. We'll start with you, Evergreen, Prashant, right? So they always say there's a free culture. Have you heard of the free culture in India? Free culture. Yeah. Normally politicians have this free culture, right? But but what in in chemistry, if you look at it, you know, it talks about lead free, mercury free, formaldehyde free. Ammonia free, solvent free, water free. I think there's so many, so many free. Yeah, is it not coming? Yeah. Is it okay? In the moment I said the free culture, it went down the voice actually. So <laughs> it became carefree. Correct. <laughs> so I think when you look at this lot of chemical free, right? So all this chemical free we are formulating. All the chemistry we all know, right? Solvent free, formaldehyde free, ammonia free, benzyl alcohol free, salicylic acid free. Why this free word? Why are we doing that? It means we need to differentiate what are the good chemical and what are the green chemistry, right? Doctor, my question is, how do you define a green chemistry, right? Or a green product or a green process? Because I'm, I'm a vegetarian, whenever I go for any buffet, there's a green dot, okay, there's a green, green product which I eat, it, right? So what, is, what does it mean green when it comes to a chemistry? That, that's what we want to understand. Yeah, yeah. Hey, first of all, uh Thanks to Irma for giving this opportunity and uh, the kind of panel uh, Venkat has organized from the different streams is really, really good and a heartening change in uh, normally for in a seminar we see a lot of lectures, lectures and lectures and uh, for some change then we go to Mr. Sate for motivational lecture. But this type of, <laughs> but this type of panel discussion is a new thing which uh, Venkat brought it. So, Thanks to him, first of all. 
and then thanks to sandeep also uh, who took efforts in two days time he implemented venkat's idea of forest green and then printing it with irma so that is also important and coming back to your green products green chemistry and all that uh, let's not make it complicated friends what we do is lot of complications we do it just go back 100 years just go back 100 years just go back 50 years what we were doing earlier and then you will find that uh, we were very very sustainable we were very very green there was absolutely no problem at all just just go back to that era then things become very very simple for example i will tell you ravi zamkindikar is here his product uh, oil bond distemper 20 years back was 100% sustainable product was 100% sustainable product oil bound distemper is a 100% sustainable product it was containing glue natural glues and all that it's a 100% sustainable product lime lime finish was a 100% sustainable product it was a green product but do we need green products first of all why we are shifting again to gr uh, green so gas based cooking we have learnt you know gas based cooking and then we are using steel utensils aluminum utensils and then uh, then uh, this uh, pan with a, a teflon coating and all that and now we have specialized restaurants cooking in earthen pots and paying four times <laughs> and paying four times similar is the concept as far as chemicals is concerned sustainable chemistry green chemistry is all about that only okay so the definition is clear for resin manufacturers i told you that uh, two examples i give you of paints which were sustainable in nature even <coughs> we had flat oil paints we had uh, glossy paints based on alkyds only now alkyd resin is probably the most sustainable product and green product known to all of us 60 to 70 years back now when i say alkyd resin alkyd resin based on three uh, raw materials it is oil coming out of vegetable glycerin coming out of biodiesel both these raw materials are uh, absolutely green what is not green is thalic anhydride can we work on thalic anhydride to make alkyd 100% green correct and you require solvent to carry that our uh, friend from egypt is already here and uh, he suggested also add my polysaccharide and you can add 15 times water correct uh, th these are the concept you see we have to go back to this concept so instead of solvent then uh, water you can add and then uh, solvents are developed uh, green solvents by even indian company jayant oil has developed green solvents so those are things available with us but now what happened when i say green then i had to charge 50% premium i had to charge 100% premium that is what has come in the end entire value chain unfortunately entire value chain when you say that product is a green product then it has to have a premium why because we have utilized our uh, resources of oil and petroleum resources so so badly that we have to come back to again to uh, these uh, products So, so, so the de definition was clear yeah yeah i think uh, you're trying to uh, give that but again the question is whether uh, industry is going to pay for the 50% premium for any alkyd i think that's a different question i'll come back on it so maybe nitesh you know you coming from the green process side right green process side you know what does what does it mean green process is are there certain reactions are defined as green or more greener than the other how, how do you classify the green process yeah i think uh, first of all there is probably nothing like green uh, product or a green process there is always a greener one because it's always like a uh, you know uh, comparative to something so there's nothing like 100% green there's always greener to an alternative uh, so and what i would call as green product is uh, you know something which is at the stage of use uh, where Uh, the set of people who are manufacturing packing using it uh, as a consumer uh, the entire set of value chain the entire set of people it is safe uh, so safe to human beings the second part is once it's used and disposed of it is safe to the nature so it doesn't pollute the nature whether in terms of uh, air water or soil and if it break down over a period of time maybe 5 years 25 years 100 years whatever it will break down into it will have a positive impact on the environment doesn't have a negative impact uh, and then the third aspect of green product is that it's manufactured through a greener process 
uh, as compared to whatever could have been. Uh, so I think a component of all three is what I would call as a green uh, product. So you're talking the entire ecosystem, you know, where everything is processed and safe, safe yeah. to the people, environment and everything. Correct. And so, so green process would be, you know, you are starting with a raw material which is bio-based, which is coming from nature right. rather than fossil fuel. You are using a manufacturing process which is as close to nature as possible in terms of you know, atmospheric pressure instead of a high pressure reaction, uh, nominal conditions of pH instead of extreme acidic or extreme alkaline. That's how otherwise our chemical reactions are. So process wise, it is as close to nature as possible. And then once the product gets made, you are using all the reagents which are as safe as possible. So, so in short, you, what you're saying is uh, using more of renewable sources rather than depletable sources. Correct. So look at it, the, you know, the entire uh, oil based you know, petrol-based value chain, that's more of a depletable. Yeah. So if you move away from depletable to a renewable, that's what how will we define. Yeah, Something so that's like just one aspect one of aspect it. The of second it. is manufacturing process. Correct. So having safe reagents, safe solvents, instead of solvent, the way nature uses water every place, can you do all the reactions in water? Can you use all the formulations in water? Correct. Because nature does everything in water. Can you do at those kind of temperatures where accidents don't happen? Accidents don't happen in nature. Accidents happen only in our chemical plants. So uh, it's a safe process, it's a grainer process, and it creates minimum amount of effluent. I'll come back to you about to give an example of specific, but in the meantime, you know, uh, Dr. Sripati, coming from a paint industry, we know green paint, right? But apart from that, what is green? How do you defend green? I think uh, uh, in terms of product, uh, green is not very easy. It's not a single component uh, definition where you say, okay, if it is safe, it is green. There are multiple facets. So one one point you raised is free, right? So X free, Y free, or benzene free, right. lead free. So that's that's the place where uh, heavily these chemicals were getting used in paint, and then that initiative started. Uh, but today, if you ask me, it is uh, it it has multiple uh, dimensions. One is toxicity to human health and toxicity to environment and then how long how long the product can last right so that's also a part of uh, green and sustainability initiative so for example uh, i will take example of sir distemper uh, distemper can last a limited uh, period of time so now we are looking at lifetime warranties 15 years 20 years so it's, it's now like a chakra view. We have traveled a distance, but there is no way going back. <laughs> right? Well, it's so it really has to driven be by performance. Right? right. Also, you need to have performance. Correct. So, and and so green. The point is That's a challenge. Yeah, performance will now become part of a green. Yeah. So, so, these are… And, and, and then the overall carbon footprint. Like, so, so, I'll tell you, you know, from the time I joined the industry in 94, from the time onwards, people talk about waterborne in industrial segment. Right? We keep on talking about waterborne. The way China, country like China, progressed very well, I don't think still we are struggling to get into those chemistry, though all the performance features have been addressed by the industry, whether it is, you know, hardness, gloss, everything has been addressed, but still why there is a, you know, challenge in people adopting that? See, what, what happens, uh, Venkat, I will tell you, see, uh, just adopting waterborne technology does not mean we are going green. See. Uh, Partly we are uh, just replacing solvent with water. Are we for not e reducing for example, the VOC? Uh, no, no. VOC reduction is there. But yeah. what is happening is, while achieving VOC reduction, now we are uh, developed uh, polymer emulsions. C3 chemistry we are developed. From propylene we are developed all the monomers, acrylic chain monomers we are developed. And then based on that we are developed polymer emulsions. Now polymer emulsions we are using into paints. Polymer emulsions are not biodegradable, neither they degrade. So water 50% is okay, but what about 50% polymer? See, we tend to forget, what happens is, we tend to forget that uh, we try to see that my house used, should be sustainable. What happens to others, other house that we are not thinking of. For example, I'll give you how many people know that uh, whenever it comes to uh, solar energy, everybody will feel it is sustainable. Solar energy, 99% of the people will put uh, saying that solar energy is sustainable. Absolutely, solar energy is sustainable. But from where it comes and who is absorbing that solar? Solar panel, how we are making solar panel? That's a question mark. See, the time you are making solar panel, you require silicon cells. How do you make silicon? 
from silica. So for one kg of uh, silicon, you are burning 10 kg of coal. So, how, so the whole value chain needs to the, be a kind of sustainable. sustainable. It's not only one part it of it. It doesn't become right. sustainable. Right. So we need to have a, developed a process. Process also should be sustainable. The solar cells also need to be made sustainable. It yeah. should be minimal. The efficiency of solar cell also need to be increased. Currently, it is only 8%. If we increase it to 15%, it makes sense because the number of solar panels will go down. So that way we have to think. But we uh, have solar panel laga diya. I'm using solar energy, green energy. Kaha se aaya bhai? Because you are importing all panels from China, yeah. so I'm not bothered about. Is that the way he look at it? Yes. No. <laughs> not <laughs> not <so> importing. <laughs> no, not in importing. fact, so <laughs> not importing. I'm talking about uh, burning of coal. You know? I understand what you're saying. Yeah, no, uh, saying in fact, just last week I read an article which was talking about that the rate at which we are implementing, uh, you know, these solar panels across the country. Uh, not very far away, just 2030 and 2050 ke beech mein we are looking at billions of tons of these solar panels being dumped because it will complete its life cycle. Yeah. And then we are looking at there is absolutely no way to, you know, harness. Correct. I think Bilkul I think it is. I also like the point you said. Solar panel dumping happening. Look at even windmills, right? Yeah. So today wind is one of the best, you know, renewable energy. And what is going to do with all the windmills end of the life cycle? Right? That's a big challenge. So again, of course, we have a solution as a group. Uh, world, worldwide, we have done that. We'll talk later. So that's so a good the, point. The positive yeah. thing in that news also was that the first week of July, uh, sorry, the first week of June, I think on the World uh, Environment Day itself, yeah. the first factory in France opened up which is claiming 100% recycle of all components of solar panel, okay. which I think is a positive news. Good. So I'll, I'll come back to uh, 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 Dr. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ashok. Yeah. Uh, but on that, uh, they are recycling the panel for very limited application like furniture and other thing. So the kind of uh, kind of uh, material we are generating is no proportional because in our factory in Baroda, we are making blades of 65 to 70 meter length. Now, where is the green there? We say we are going for a wind energy which is green. But where is the epoxy coming from? So you work is with, it, is, is, you, is you, it you, you work with the idea Bula will give you a recyclable epoxy. We are, we, we are, we'll, work, we'll we are working it. with you already, we'll but the it. solution is still quite distant. We will we'll do it. So <laughs> going back to Dr. Deepak, you know, so I think, see, other, moving away a little bit, right? People talk about carbon footprint, right? Carbon emission, carbon footprint. I think from a carbon man language, what is this carbon footprint? How is, you can go there, yeah. How is, how is this carbon footprint, uh, you know, measured, quantified, captured? You coming from a, you know, uh, consulting background, you know, how do you look at that? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. Thank yeah. you uh, for having me here. Uh, so in terms of carbon footprint, you know, before we get into this entire carbon accounting business, etc., how many of you have spent your childhood on the east coast of India, in Odisha, you know, Andhra Pradesh, that Deccan area, etc.? After that accident, I don't think anybody has any uh, intention yes. to... <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but but you know, so in on the east coast of India, cyclones are very frequent, right? right? So in fact, you know, talking about the accident, you know, Odisha was able to deploy you know resources quickly because they were ready for disaster. They were ready for disaster for you know from cyclones, etc. Right? But you know, how many of you have seen cyclones near Mumbai? In near Mumbai, it, so in, I I am born of yeah, born and brought up in 1980s. I have never seen any cyclone in Mumbai, but it it is started you know to happen. So in uh, 2021, we had a cyclone in Ratnagiri, right? 
the those changes which are happening those are happening because of you know greenhouse effect or you know global warming etc so areas which we never saw cyclones they are having cyclones now areas which were drought prone they are having floods now so these are the after effects of you know uh, the co2 emissions which uh, you know, which are released into atmosphere because of human activities. Now, if you look at CO2 emissions broadly, you know, there are three sources of CO2 emissions in any industry. The first is the CO2 which is emitted out of combustion of any fossil fuel. So, for example, in a, in a boiler, which is used for, you know, any chemical industry, you are burning coal, that coal after burning, it is, you know, converted into CO2, which is sort of, you know, emitted from the stack, etc. So, that is the first part of, you know, CO2 emissions which is happening in, the, in any industry. The second thing which happens is, you know, we have captive thermal power plants or we are consuming electricity from grid. So any, you know, so MSME, for example, they will consume electricity from grid and they'll say, Hamari answer to CO2 emit ni ho rahe. But, you know, CO2 has been emitted in some thermal power plants which is located far away. So that, that you are, you know, as a consumer, you are also responsible for the CO2 emission which is happening there. So that is the second, you know, second bit of emission. The third is, you know, the process emissions. So process emissions are typically emissions that happen because of chemical reactions. So any chemical reaction, you know, that involves C, if it is sort of, you know, combusted. For example, in cement industry, there is CaCO3, which is converted into CaO and CO2, right? So that is called as process emissions. So, so these are three ways in which CO2 so emissions... this captured and quantified? Yes. So, yeah. so, you know, so I think most of us uh, might be used to energy, you know, energy intensity account because of the performance, perform achievement traits came from Bureau of Energy Efficiency. So, you know, that is, that is something which is happening. I think, you know, MSME is not a part of uh, a patch scheme, but that is something which is happening. Now, when we talk about carbon emission accounting, which is something which will come into the picture shortly, because in the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, Ministry of Power, they are working on developing carbon markets. So, what, you know, quantifying uh, carbon emissions means, you know, you are producing X tons of, let's say, you know, any chemical, Right? You are using 100 units of coal, for example, and each unit of coal has some factors that each unit of coal has, you know, 30% carbon, so you will get 30% CO2. So that is, you know, emissions which is coming from the, the coal which is burnt in the, in the boiler or in any chemical industry. The second is you are consuming electricity from grid. So for every unit of electricity which you are consuming from grid, there is certain amount of CO2 emission which can be attributed, which is around 0.71 kgs of CO2 per unit of electricity. So that is something which will be accounted for. And the third is on process emissions, etc. Based on the amount of you know, chemicals that you are producing, etc. The emissions accounting will be done. Now this accounting, you know, so far companies are reporting them voluntarily. That right? you know, so Aditya Birla Group, for example, they will say our emissions intensity is so and so much, right? But nobody is you know, certifying nobody, no independent certifier which is authorized by the government of India is actually certifying those emissions or emissions intensity. Therefore, what will happen now is when the carbon pricing thing comes into picture, there will be government authorized, you know, uh, carbon uh, accountants who will actually go in each and every company and they will measure what is your total amount of emissions. Okay, you claim your total amount of emissions is X. Right? They'll go and verify, okay, is, is it all adding up to X or not, right? No, so I, I think, you know, I understand it's how important because, you know, Europe has set up a carbon tax, right? Yes, yes. So, what they're talking about is 16% to 20% of all imports from these developing countries should pay the tax if they have more carbon emissions. So, that's where this carbon, you know, certificate, what they call yes. it. And, and certificate is very important, which will be audited by a third party or a regulatory body in Europe. So all the factories in India, you know, starting from this third quarter, October, they are telling you should start submitting the carbon emission numbers to this particular company if you really want to export to Europe. That's a kind of... so. Yes. And they'll need guarantees on your emissions intensity. Right. Therefore, they'll have their own auditors or accredited auditors who will come to your plant, who will measure your performance and they'll compute that, yeah, this plant has an emission intensity of X. They can, you know, sort of export or, you know, export it to European Union. This particular plant, it has an emission intensity of Y, which is, you know, higher than our value. Therefore, they will not be allowed to, you know, export to European Union. So, that is something which is happening. But also, there is a political angle to that. Uh, you know, so what is happening is, European Union, for example, you know, they have been, they are responsible. You know, something, there is, there is something called as, you know, historical accountability. 
So European Union, you know, all the developed countries, they are developed because they have, you know, used this cheaper and, you know, abundantly available fossil fuels, etc. And because they have been, you know, historical accountancy and historical liability, they have committed to achieving net zero. And in the process of achieving net zero, their industries have not been competent. And therefore, just to save their own industries, to save their own jobs, etc., they are coming up with these things like, you know, carbon border adjustment mechanism, no, they call it as carbon leakage, etc. In the form of outsourcing, they have moved all the, you know, low-cost manufacturing into Asia. Yes. And then they are saying, you know, you need to pay their tax. It's yes. all, you know, that's yes. where their $100 billion uh, they are supposed to pay to the developing countries to implement certain uh, process. Uh, that's not uh, happening Nothing now. is coming, it's but not nothing is coming in. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. So, a bit a different topic. Thanks. I think there's a good, uh, you know, uh, understanding of that. So, I think, uh, Sashok, you know, how are the Indian industries, you know, how are they investing in this sustainable, there's a cost, right, always. It, it doesn't come cheap, right. You need to have, improve your process, you need to biosource your raw material. Are Indian industries investing enough to really drive the sustainability goals? So, maybe you can talk from the Reliance perspective. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, before touching Reliance, there are two perspectives. You know, there are uh, uh, industries uh, um, uh, not forming part of MSME or uh, SME. Uh, they are really not in, um, investing. Let's be frank enough on that. Then, of course, there are groups like Aditya Birla's, Reliance and other things. They are investing because they can afford it. As simple as that. Uh, the basic thing, a lot of R&D has to get, go into that, which needs a lot of investment. And that it starts, uh, it's a complete value chain. It's it start from the, the, the raw material, your conventional uh, material has to be converted into the, the um, uh, bio, with bio, bio substance, it has to be converted into, which is not happening. Now the company like Reliance in investing, uh, uh, basically in the material, uh, we are having alternate, uh, you know, bio material like uh, rice husk, we are trying to, you know, develop in, uh, develop into a polymer, uh, polymer which is uh, epoxy compatible also. Uh, then morning, uh, Dr. Pandit was also talking about the cardinal. So that also is one of the substance we are using. So that is on the raw material part of it. Now you have to have the technology also and the recyclability of your end product which we are into. Now so much of uh, material is being generated and as uh, Nitesh, uh, Nishad also said, another 20 years we won't have any space. If we are not coming up with the recyclability or reuse or some something of this, so this this is very dangerous situation uh, to land into okay. for the for the industry. At this point of time, everything is either you know landing up in a cement clean or, no, or some of the landfills. I think this has to. No, landfill is not possible. That's going to add your carbon. Landfill is you know? not possible because the state pollution boards are not permitting at all. So the only permission they are giving is the is the cement kilns only, and the uh, sending it to kiln is a big cost. Is a bit there? They are, you have to sell it. You, there is a transportation cost. So you do not. The viability of the product goes for uh, hay, hay wire. If you go and do that, so you have to come up with uh, with some kind of solution. Reusing and recycling is a way forward. We have. It's no a way forward, to, but then uh, yeah. using the bio product, bio substance itself as a raw material is is an investment, is an R and D area which the industry has to work into. That is the problem we are facing when we are into the di downstream uh, kind of product. So you mean to say that we have no option but to invest in this kind of advanced technologies to make our environment better. So either we need to align with the global industries or get those technologies if we don't have, right? That's that's a key. 
again, again, the technologies are more suiting to the European and Americans. We need to come up with our own technologies. And uh, that is where there are some, some industries and some R&D centers are working on to that. They are like rice husk uh, getting converted into polymer is not uh, uh, European technology. It's an uh, Indian um, uh, you know, material which is available in, in, in plenty. So that kind of R&D uh, we have to do with the kind of material available in our subcontinent. Do you know an Indian company which is working on the recycling blades and everything? Great technology. We 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 know that uh, country, but they are pulverizing uh, the kind of. Uh, no, I'm asking. Do you know the company, Indian company, which is doing this recyclability of blades globally? Uh, not really. That's why they are not. No, no. You are not doing the recyclability. <laughs> you, I'm saying you, you, you are you are giving giving the polymer right. where so you can one, extract. Once, once you are given sponsorship, no, the, no repetition <laughs> of that. <laughs> That no repetition. We, we are trying to avoid that, Venkat. <laughs> no, the, the fact I was saying no, what, is not what, about, not about, either, you know, the point is, if today the wind blades are not recyclable, it's going in, it's a big hazardous. It's a polluting industry. Today I'll tell you, it's proud for every Indian. It's not because of sponsorship. It's proud for every Indian. This is an Indian company, Aditya Billa Group. We are the first one to address this problem where every blade that is produced can be recycled. You can remove the glass fiber, thermoset, become thermoplastic. So I am saying it's not about Aditya Billa, it's about every Indian we feel proud about. That's why by bringing that point on this side. So again, you know, moving on the little bit on the paint side, you know, we will see everybody talks about volatile organic content, right? So how do you reduce this? What, what are the options you have? You know, uh, how do you work on this view? Everybody, it's easy to say, remove the solvents, right? Well, what is the challenge you have? How do you manage this? So, uh, before I take your question, I would like to tell one thing that sustainability or green or usage of renewable always doesn't mean that there is a cost. Right. So, there are, Excellent. There are, good, number of, uh, there are good number of cases right. uh, where, in fact, it was other way around. We could achieve right. value savings out of, uh, out of this movement. In fact, VOC is one of them. Like, uh, in the beginning, uh, you were right. Cost was a challenge. Um, second, technology was a challenge. Third, consumer was a challenge. So there were three sets of challenges. Technologically, there were some solution available in Western world. Right. Uh, in India, their availability as well as the bulk supply. You you know the scale. Once we get into it, the scale need to support us. Right. So I think there uh, the material selection. Uh, in fact, there are good number of options like since once you know the chemistry you also know how to shift from uh, for example from propylene glycol to diethylene glycol or to triethylene glycol so that shift you know how to choose and when to choose what blend you need to choose so that is one major step that has been taken where we could cut down VOCs second thing uh, today I think there was one lecture on water incorporation in Alkid I think there's also a, a very good approach where whatever you put in paint, for example, in uh, solvent-based paint, 50 to 60 percent of it goes to environment. Right. I think Absolutely. that's a loss for everyone. Right. But uh, there's no other way because if you want to protect your substrate, <laughs> that much emission you need to do. So I think there are such technologies. So whether it is emulsifier technology or polysaccharide technology, they are going to help. So, in fact, there is another version to it. Generally, in decorative paint, people perceive that solvent-based paints are the one who contribute most to VOC. But actually, it's other way around. That's only because the volumes we sell in solvent-based versus right. water-based, it is a big difference. True. So, even a 100 gram of VOC in water-based can contribute much more than what we sell in solvent-based paint. So, both directions, Asian Paints as an R&D uh, unit at Asian Paints, we have taken up and I think we could achieve, uh, if you, if some of you read the uh, annual reports where we publish uh, what's the VOC reduction no, that we I, achieved. I read it, I just say that it's uh, by in 2020 till that time, Asian Paints has reduced almost 24 million uh, kilo of VOC from paints. Yeah. This is a great achievement, you know, uh, leading from front on the sustainability issue, it's, it's a great uh, 
achievement. So, so there again, uh, his point becomes valid. See, in, in sustainability, each of us have to play a role. Right. And it's, it's never going to be an absolute number, right? It's always a relative from where you are and where you go. So, each of us get opportunity there. Once we set the benchmark for us, I think setting benchmark is the most difficult part for any industry and organization. Once you set that, then you know where to move and how to move. So, I think, you know… Uh, yeah, you're See, adding lot of solvents in the beginning and those solvents if you reduce and then show that we are becoming more and more sustainable, you know, that kind of thing. Then uh, you are using C3 chemistry, suppose, uh, propylene chemistry. And from propylene chemistry, you go to C2 chemistry, ethylene chemistry. Then I am reducing carbon uh, emissions from C3 to C2. So, uh, those things are okay. But what I feel is, uh, he also said Sripati, see, small, small inventions are quite possible to make our product sustainable. And I can see a uh, lot of intelligent people, lot of brains are available here who can think about it, you know. Not uh, great invention, not great investment is required towards that. And uh, it is not that difficult to make your products green or sustainable. It is, it is achievable. And it is achievable for small industry also, MSME or medium scale industry also, and as well as a bigger industry also. It is possible. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Doctor. One, one thing is people should not feel that we are giving too much job. You are the same as you are the same as you are the no, one thing I am very cautious, you know, is not that we are trying to gya give gyan about this, how to be sustainable. So, my next question to all of you is, can you give one example, maybe three examples we take, what we have implemented in the industry, what has happened, how we have done it, some contribution to the, who wants to take it up, it's an open question. I'll, I'll yeah, take go it ahead, uh, go ahead, Sripati. Yeah. See, uh, I think one initiative uh, that we have taken up four or five years ago is uh, uh, identify which ingredient in the paint formulation contribute the most to carbon footprint, right? So, it's when you do that assessment, it's really surprising that only two components contribute to nearly 80 percent of it. So, then we consciously took two steps. One, how to optimize those ingredients. So, I think there we could cut down, I, I just take last year's uh, example, we could cut down 20,000 metric tons CO2, scope 3 emission. Wow. Just by understanding Analyzing where it. and yeah. how to optimize it. So, that's been already implemented yeah. or getting implemented. Right. So, fantastic. And, right. and it also gives, uh, the, it's not a cost, it's in fact the saving. Because TiO2 is the one which, which has highest carbon footprint in a paint. Actually, the small scale industry in India were the first one to reduce VOC with the uh, Hulyarkar technology, in redox, in redox at primer, adding water into that. Earlier, everybody was using solvent, but the solvent was greatly uh, replaced by water by adding some additive. <laughs> so, that, that kind of inventions are possible and uh, quality uh, is uh, not only maintained, uh, quality was found to be better, even the flow was better in that by addition of water. Nobody was knowing that. Fantastic. So, so time consumer become challenge actually. Mm -hmm. So, uh, some of the water-based uh, technologies I remember we marketed, they came back because they were not smelling like paint, they were not, <laughs> they were so, not getting so the people, feel in the hand. So, people don't believe it's a paint unless it <laughs> yeah, smells like a paint. Uh, it smells like a paint and they should get that yeah. uh, feeling in the hand. So, sometimes consumers don't know what they want, right? So, so we need I to think go and educate, it, it's so. really difficult and I think there I, most of our energy shall go in moving forward, right. how to educate and how to because it's my neighborhood. So, that's one example. Any, any other example? You want to share, uh, Dr. Deepak, what you have done with the government or any other organization, how you implemented this? Yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, I can give an example. Uh, when I joined CW in 2019, right? So, at that time, green hydrogen was something which was relatively new, right? So, nobody was even talking about green hydrogen. Fortunately, I had done my PhD in green hydrogen. So, I knew what green hydrogen was, etc. So, you know, when we started in 2019, 2020, uh, you know, the government wanted to frame a policy on green hydrogen. Uh, so, at that time, you know, given my background and the capability that we had in the team, we gave a lot of inputs, technical inputs to the government, starting from, you know, what is the cost of green hydrogen, now how do we optimize the cost of green hydrogen, you know, how do we size solar, how do we size wind, how do we size electrolyzers, etc. You know, what is the current consumption of hydrogen in India, right? So, you know, something like that. Uh, what are the project market, you know, the market potential today, the market projections in future, how will the cost of green hydrogen pan out in the future? Uh, you know, so these assessments, one assessment could was, you know, on refineries, for example, you know, what if we start 
blending green hydrogen in in refineries so you know we gave numbers like you know if you start blending 25 30 percent green hydrogen today the prices of petrol and diesel will increase only by 80 paisa 90 paisa nobody will even notice 80 90 paisa increase in price of petrol and diesel because we are at 100 rupees per liter today right so one rupee increase is nothing so those are the insights that we gave to the government again i think dr Venga, you talked about you know safety you talked about the the bhopal gas accident you know hydrogen also has some history especially on your know, safety related aspects so right. that is where we gave some inputs, etc. So in the, all that inputs that we gave uh, culminated into the policy which was, you know, released by the, the government. Uh, now, you know, we have also worked with two state governments. I cannot name them. But, you know, we are working with two states government. We are where we are helping develop state level green hydrogen policies. Uh, you know, and those policies we have been released. One state has been sort of released the policy. The other state will be releasing those policies. So, you know, that is that is what we have done in the past uh, four years. I'd no, no, I think, you know, uh, I really appreciate that because the hydrogen topic comes in. You know, I think one of the most uh, important invention in chemical industry over the period, if you have to name one important invention, that's, I think, Haber-Bosch process of ammonia, right? It, it's uh, one of the oldest invention. But now they recently discovered to transport hydrogen, ammonia is the best option, yes. right? The same, you know, invention today, I think the, you talk about hydrogen, one is producing it, and how are we going to transport? They're going to transport in the form of ammonia. So it's that's uh, that's where the direction people yeah, are working. So on, on ammonia, it is the best the the best way for intercontinental movement of energy. So earlier we used to transport crude oil, etc. But when we're talking about green fuels, you know, green ammonia is the best way to transport hydrogen from you know, let's say India to Japan or India to European Union, etc. So, so that is something that we have learned from the chemical industry actually. So great, the two examples we got what we implemented. Any other example anybody wants to share? Last one example. So uh, this is an example of uh, the work that we did with a pharmaceutical company uh, in my business organization. So this is an anti-AIDS drug called Nevrepin which is given to women who are carrying HIV virus so that the virus HIV doesn't travel to the you know child in the womb. So this drug is given to them. So one part of the process, our customer was using a very high pressure reaction, maybe about 10 to 15 bar kind of a pressure. They were using hydrogen gas as a source of hydrogen for that hydrogenation reaction. They were using a pyrophoric catalyst like nickel, which would catch fire if it comes into contact with air. And they were using methanol as a solvent, which is flammable. And the reaction was exothermic. So you can see that you are sitting on a time bomb, right. literally. Right. So we shifted that to a process which was based in water. So we replaced methanol as a solvent with water. We could do the reaction at atmospheric pressure. We could do it at a pH of about 5 to 6, which is pretty neutral. And once the product was taken out from water, we could recycle the entire water, not one, two, three times, but 800 times, which is kind of unheard in the pharma industry because they are very skeptical about quality. They don't, because the ultimate drug goes for human consumption, right. they would not take chance with, you know, even uh, costly solvents, they would distill out or throw away at cheap, away, uh, cheap prices, but not recycle it. But we actually literally proved it to them saying absolutely no problems in recycling. So it's all necessity is a mother of all inventions. So then they could actually yeah. recycle water for two and a half years without throwing out a single litre. The same water. Fantastic. So I think very good three examples of it got implemented. Now, I think we don't have much time, maybe I'll have one or two questions, right? So maybe coming in from a different industry, if you look at consumer-based industry, let's say personal care, right? Uh, if you look at product like Fair and Lovely, it's my very favorite product whenever I speak about it. And this product contains an active called niacinamide, very, you know, uh, coming from a synthetic base. And today, the entire thing has been replaced by a green ingredients. Now, they're talking about apple seed extract, pear seed extract, and these are the extracts which are used to disperse melanin on your skin. So when it comes on a personal care product, today the consumer prefers the green ingredients when compared to the synthetic. So there's a huge shift happening where the consumers are willing to pay whatever you talk about, 40% more, 50% more, because very health conscious. That industry has really gone ahead. Again, chemistry. Again, chemistry going by the dying on that, that is an uh, uh, example on it. So the other question I have, maybe two more questions, last two questions. So. If you look at it, Doctor, I think this question for you. So today, there are big, large corporates who are willing to invest, put capital, you know, get the process, get the technology, drive this initiative, right? 
then what happens to the small scale, medium scale, right? Because sustainability is a responsibility, a combined responsibility of the entire, you know, gamut of people and industry. What is the role of this larger corporate and of course government towards or responsibility towards the smaller scale industry in helping them or how do you see that? See, there is always a, a war between uh, bigger industry and smaller industries whether it is paint industry, plastic industry or any industry. So bigger industry is not going to help uh, small scale or MSME. So don't, uh, we cannot just expect that. But I am telling you again, the uh, small scale and MSME industry, the brains are more brighter and sharper brains are there. So they have to help themselves. And in many cases, they have done that successfully. And in this case also, I feel, you know, rather than the bigger industry, smaller and medium uh, uh, MSME can become uh, sustainable or greener or biodegradable pro product, can bring them very, very quickly because they are more focused on that. So they will be able to do it much better compared to uh, bigger industry. Huh? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, you know, I, I think at the end of the, what I believe, it's also a responsibility of the larger corporates and the government to really support in terms of technology, even government can look at giving a subsidy to a smaller industry. If they started reducing their carbon emission, they started doing something. I think that's the only way you promote a whole ecosystem. You know, it can't happen. Somebody is 100% green, other way you're polluting the environment and you're competing. So that, that system will not be sustainable. So I think the responsibility is both on the government and the large corporate. That's what I believe maybe. I think associations like IRMA, if we can do something, towards on that, that may be a catalyzing the whole operation. That's what uh, I was thinking on that. The concessions or uh, giving subsidy, you know, for such things will never work actually. It has never worked. Subsidy is a very, very temporary phenomena. For solar cells also, government wanted to give subsidy. For EV, they wanted to give some subsidy. But that's not a permanent phenomena. One, one has to be self-sustainable. Whichever industry, why classify small, medium or uh, bigger industry? It has and then to I be agree that point, you need to compete, uh, you know, in terms of your technology, you know, cost, every aspect of it, you know. Agreed. Yeah, any I other comments? Yes. I, I think, uh, yeah, he may be like, he may be right that there won't be any direct support, right? So, it's, it's there's not, not going to be any hand-holding type of support. Uh, but there are many indirect supports that uh, small industries can get. One thing is the larger industries uh, started uh, publishing their sustainability initiatives. Right. So that also sets a direction to follow, right? Like uh, so Dow Jones Sustainability yeah, Index. Yeah, Dow Jones Sustainability Index or even uh, IRBR reporting. Yeah, right. So that means uh, others get a chance or others get a direction where the things are moving. So then a follow up automatically happens. So it propels. Yeah. And second thing is, uh, when larger industries start more specific about sustainability, then uh, one element of that is responsible sourcing. That's right. Right. So, in responsible sourcing, I think many small industries can get a better advantage. Uh, but all of this can be done only with innovation at R&D. So, means there have to be a value proposition in that product that must demonstrate technical superiority. Investing R&D is a key yeah. here, yeah. So that would be the key. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, uh, when we talk about the initiatives by the government, uh, it's not necessarily be in the form of subsidy. There could be some kind of embargoes on use of certain practices and uh, substances, you know. So uh, that is where uh, uh, some kind of uh, filtration will take place at the basic level. So, what you are left with is some fair thing which is good for the environment, which is good for the small scale also and for the uh, uh, large scale corporates also. And coming back to IRMA uh, kind of initiative, now IRMA can play a very vital role. Now, see the today's platform where all kind of industries are there. We are exchanging in kind of bonhomies being generated. So, let's share uh, our experiences with each other, give a kind of feeling where we... Uh, Say we are not competing with each other, we are working in tandem uh, with the new technology and initiatives which are helpful to the environment. So I think those kind of approaches uh, uh, a couple of years down the line should help the industry and um, 
Uh, one more point uh, on, on net zero, I would like to say as far as Reliance is concerned, the government of India's net zero target, you know, is 2070. Right. Uh, in, in, in Reliance, we have taken a kind of pledge that uh, by 2035, we'll be 100% net zero uh, uh, in terms of using all kind of uh, fossil fuel and con conventional kind of uh, things by solar or wind or whatever. So that kind of pledge can be taken at any level. Now the challenges will be there, but then one has to come up and, and uh, try to address. And this forum can give that kind of platform where we can uh, discuss our challenge and try to complement each other with our with our efforts and initiatives. Yeah. Thank you. I think, you know, uh, maybe we are just uh, the end of this panel discussion. I don't know uh, what we tried to attempt just to get the feedback and what has been implemented. So is there anything that we can say, maybe if we, you know, if people have to go from this forum? Two, three things if we can follow, simple thing, towards sustainability. Can you give one idea quickly? Who wants to start? Yeah, but see, uh, basic innovation and uh, going by, back to the history, for example, I will tell you the uh, in the resin industry. See, one of the most 100% sustainable resin you have available is uh, not alkyd, ester gum, is one of the 100% sustainable uh, resin available with you. Can you not modify ester gum? The rosin is coming from natural sources. The glycerin is coming yeah. from natural sources. Penta, this Perstrop, now they are done the sponsorship, so I have to say good things about them. That's a separate <laughs> issue. So, <laughs> they are also supplying this uh, uh, sustainable Penta, green Penta they are supplying. So, you uh, make uh, this uh, simple resins like ester gum also uh, to work in uh, quality paints, possible hydrogenated ester gum, uh, disproportionate uh, rosin, See, these are the uh, simple ideas. Why make things complicated? Simple ideas also you can culminate into nice products. So think about uh, such simple ideas. Don't think that uh, when for making my uh, products green or making sustainable, I have to invest heavily, government has to help me, all that thing is not required. You are fully, uh, fully competent. You are fully competent to do that and you will be able to achieve that much better way. And you can compete with uh, Europe, USA, Everywhere, isn't it, Zainul? You are doing that, correct? Thank you, Deepak. Very quick. Uh... Yeah. So uh, my thing is, you know, look for low-hanging fruits and pluck them, right? So low-hanging fruits are things like energy efficiency, for example. Right. Uh, you know, low-hanging fruit is something like the rooftop solar, for example. Correct. Uh, low-hanging fruit could be, you know, something like the, the, the technology options that you know others uh, panelists suggested. So look for low-hanging fruits, pluck them and reduce your carbon intensity. And reduce and your water usage. Reduce your water, water usage, zero discharge, etc. Right. And once you have identified consumers who are willing to pay the premium, then you supply them greener commodities. Perfect. Thank you. Sripati? Yeah, I think first thing would be, uh, as Dr. Prashant said, no, it's like first level is the confidence. Right. I, I, I have seen, I have experienced, many of the innovation nowadays are coming from small and medium scale industries. They are not coming from bigger ones. Excellent. So, I think uh, as an Indian, uh, we all have enough competency. We can contribute to sustainability. So, couple of things, we, if you can quickly go back and check, because it's a resin manufacturer uh, association. So, how solvent can be replaced with water? And then, how how much renewable I can bring in to the resin more, right? So, whether it is hybrid, whether it is uh, a newer chemistry, like a click chemistry or other chemistries which we can try and get more renewable into the resin and replacing solvent with water. Thank you. So, uh, I think from uh, MSME's perspective, I would uh, suggest two things. One, I second his, uh, I was just about to say that, that there are small, small stuff, uh, uh, you know, or initiatives in your plant that you can take which would add to a lot of savings in terms of energy, water and a whole bunch of places. Uh, so, uh, that is one place where there is gold mine sitting there, it's a low hanging fruit. Uh, that is something that we should tap on and the more we encourage that as a management because the set of people who are sitting are decision makers, your plant people get really empowered which is a very, you know, it has a very catalytic effect then the plant people start looking for places where they can improve further. So uh, that's something that I strongly recommend to look for those small, small areas for improvement in plant, which doesn't require a massive investment. 
The second thing is TAP Academic and Research, uh, Academic and Research Institute. It's a very good point. Very so good it's point, a yeah. it's a massive resource we are sitting on. I interact a lot of, lot with IIT Bombay. They are hungry for SMEs to come. I mean, you will be surprised at the cost at which they will do projects for you. It's mind blowingly low. So much, so much affordable, and they are just waiting for Excellent the industry point. to come. Excellent. And point. probably they are waiting. Industry would take one step forward. Industry is waiting that. I am busy with my stuff and the you know academic institute will come to you. I would say you take step one step forward, connect with IIT Bombay, ICT and a whole bunch of academic institutions, they would love to help you out. Great point. Thank you, Nidesh. So gentlemen, that's the end of this panel discussion and uh, the panel is open for questions now from the audience. If you have time, I don't know, Ms. Madhavan. Maybe two questions since I told them so. You want one? Okay, one question. Okay, two questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Not a question, it's a suggestion. I think social aspect could touch Nikia. Or may out of the box bath karo. Yahajo better industrialist, nothing. May manufacture a new trader room. Mary Bath could hurt Kia. West management ko hum ko touch karna chahiye. Uh, we all have West plastic. Uh, log plastic ko hatane ki baat kar rahe. Kabhi nahi hatega. Doot kis mein aayega? Plastic mein aayega. Tel hi kis mein aayega? Aapke cold drinks vagar aate hai. Usme you, you cannot remove plastic from your life. It is there. It uska percentage badega ghatega nahi. To karna kya chahiye? Plastic ko remove karo alag se. Aapke ghar mein, office mein, industry mein, do dustbin honne chahi. Har jagah, everywhere, right now, here also. A pair of dustbins. Ek mein plastic aayega, metal, kaanch, vagere, jo bhi hai. You know, all dry waste. And, and other mein, sabji, baji, biodegradable items. Hotel ke bahar, yahan par, hum log jahan khana khate, wahan par do dustbin honne chahi. Plastic ke bottle paani ki, ek mein jani chahi, us mein sirf plastic ke bottle jani chahi. Plastic ke bottle ke saath, jab sambar jata hai, rice jata hai, pulao jata hai, तो प्लास्टिक बोतल अलग नहीं होगी, वो जमीन पे जाएगी, लैंडफिल्स भर गए हैं, देवनार डंपिंग यार्ड पे जाके आया हूँ पर्सनली, अंदर जाने अलाउड नहीं, मैं अंदर जाके हूँ दो किलोमीटर, अनऑफिशियली, वहाँ पर मतलब इट्स ऑल डर्टी, तो हमें करना क्या है, बॉटम लाइन, हमारे घरों में दो डस्टबि� आपको स्वीपर को अलग से देना है पूरी सोसाइटी के 500 जितने भी फ्लैट है उसको प्लास्टिक जो भी है ड्राई वेस्ट शुड बी कलेक्टेड सेपरेटली इट इज सेलेबल विद इन हाफ ए किलोमीटर वो स्क्रैप वाला है भंगार वाला वो परचेज करता है मुझे सबके रेट भी मालूम है पूठा का क्या भाव न्यूज पेपर का क्या भाव प्लास्टिक का क्या भाव इट इज सेलेबल अच्छा फिर वो स्वीपर को कलेक्ट कैसे करेंगी बने बड़ा बड़ा थैला बनाया है ढाई फुट बाई चार फुट लंबा प्लास्टिक अभी मेरी गाड़ी में भी है बीस थैले पड़े तो स्वीपर को मैं देता हूँ फ्री ये लो इसमें जमा करो एक हफ्ता दस दिन में जितना एक भर जाएगा थैला तो जाके बेचो अगर उनका बिकता नहीं है तो मैं गाड़ी में डिक्की में डाल के उनको ले जाकर के बिकवा भी देता हूँ ये हमको करना है बिल्कुल सही मैंने बीएमसी ऑफिसर्स को बोला कमिश्नर को आप मिक्स कचरा लेते क्यों हो आप गुनहगार हो सबसे बड़े स्टॉप टेकिंग पीपल विल हैव टू सेपरेट we must separate dry and wet waste. That is the best thing that we could do and the easiest thing. Ajay, usse paise bhi aate hai. Sweeper ko paise milenge. I know, ek sweeper, humare society ka sweeper, there are about 50 flats. Jisko 600 rupiah mita tha mahina ka bech ke, abhi usko 1200 mil raha hai. Oh, mere ko itna, mela ye karte hai, thank you. It's really a good point. You're bringing a basic awareness. Exactly. What need to be there. Yeah. So, thank you very much. And we have any last question? One last question. To the panel, if you have any question for the panel. Otherwise, we can conclude this. Thank you. Yeah. So, so what we'll do is, what's your good name? Sadeep, I have some information, maybe I'll share it with you, this carbon tax, when is it getting implemented, what is the structure and what one should do, we have detailed information, I'll share with you. We'll talk in the evening, yeah, sure. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's a wonderful panel, I think they truly appreciate everybody. You know, sharing their things. <laughs> Fabulous. I appreciate you because she's wearing green jersey. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
I would request our president to please uh, join for the momento. Gokulani ji will be joining us. <laughs> we shall be proceeding with the momento for our panelist. It's, it's, it's good. Thank you. A huge Thank round of applause to Dr. Venkatraman. Thank you. That's okay. So I'll give it some. <laughs> it's okay. No problem. Yeah. Mr. Ashok Dube. Dr. Prashant Samant, yours truly. Dr. Yadav. Come on, everyone. Can we have a huge round of applause for our panelists? It was indeed one of the interesting segments. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much.